Hello, good evening, church. Good evening, brothers and sisters in Christ. Good evening, everyone. Welcome again um, to this special um, program. On behalf of our pastors, I would like to welcome you to this month, the month of um, worship and prayer night. I'm so glad that you are able to join me. You are able to join us as a church. And on this note, I feel that it is really befitting that we actually give God um, the glory and the, and the honor for this opportunity that you are able to join us. I'm going to read the Bible passage to us. It's taken from the book of Psalms, Psalms chapter 103, verses 1 and 2. Psalms chapter 103, verses 1 and 2. It says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. It says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not his benefits. What are these benefits that we are referring to? I think we need to be thanking God for these benefits. And what are these benefits? The benefits that I can see there are the benefits of sleeping and waking up. These are the good things that he has done for us. These are the things that he has done for us on a daily basis. Uh, we have the benefits of salvation. We have the benefits of being saved when we sleep. We have the benefits of, of healing. So we are going to praise God. Just join me and praise God this evening and say, Father, we thank you, O oh God, uh, that in this this month of February, the second month of the year 2022, that Lord, uh, we want to thank you for your benefits, your kind deeds uh, that you have shown to us, that you have shown to us as a family, that you have shown to us as a, as a people of God, uh, that you have shown to us as a church lord we say thank you thank you oh god for these kindness thank you oh god for these benefits oh god we thank you oh god for forgiving us of our sins it's one of the benefits that they were be, that was being referred to in the book of Psalms. father we say thank you oh god for healing us oh god for taking away our sins for taking away our shortcomings oh god for redeeming our souls lord we just want to say thank you thank you oh god on this glorious day the 25th day oh god we just want to praise your name we just want to exalt your name thank you everlasting father for the mighty name of jesus we have prayed i also think there's another reason to thank the lord our god today in psalms 118 one psalms sorry psalms 116 verse 8 the bible says that you have delivered my soul from death my eyes from tears and my feet from falling therefore we want to thank the lord that throughout this year he has delivered our feet from falling. He has delivered our souls from death. He has delivered our eyes, oh God, our eyes from being shed, from, from being tearful. Lord, we say thank you. Thank you, oh God for these great and merciful things that you have shown us. Uh, day by day, you renew your, your strength in us. Day by day, oh God, uh, you renew your compassion in us. Therefore, we are so grateful. We are so grateful for the things that you have done for us throughout this year. Lord, we give you the glory. Lord, we give you the honor. Lord, we give you the praise. Uh, thank you, everlasting Father, for the mighty, mighty name of Jesus we have prayed. I also want to say thank you, God, uh, for every worshiper who has joined us this evening. Father, we ask, oh God, that Father, as they have joined us, oh Lord, that, that they will have a fresh and encounter with you, oh God, that through the words that will be delivered, through the word that will be spoken today, in the mighty name of Jesus. Father, we are so grateful for all these great and mighty things uh, that you are doing for us, oh God. Uh, thank you, everlasting Father, for the mighty name of Jesus we have prayed. And one final prayer for me uh, as well is that, Father, that Lord, that today, let the encounter that we have, let it change our destiny, O oh Father, in the mighty name of Jesus. Join with me and pray unto our God and say, Father, you are the destiny changing God. Lord, let the, the word that comes up today, O oh Father, let it change our destiny today in the mighty name of Jesus we have prayed. Thank you, everlasting Father, for everything that you are going to do in our lives today. We glorify you, we honor you, we adore you, O oh God. For the mighty, mighty name of Jesus we have prayed. Amen and amen. We are now going to listen to our Royal Voices who are going to talk us through a, a, a session of praise and worship. Over to Royal Voices, please. Thank you. Clap those hands. Stop those feet. Come on. Lord, you are good and your mercy endureth forever. Yes. Lord, you are good and your mercy endureth forever. Lord, you are good. You. Hallelujah. 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 
you 
to bless the Lord for yet another beautiful time in the presence of God. Tonight is another power night, a night of encounter. We are yet to worship the most high God, the creator of the ends of the earth. You can hear the choir exalting the Lord that our God has been too good. Tonight is here to hear our cry as we worship and reference him, lift him high. He will answer us speedily tonight in Jesus' name. We are about to thank the Lord. Thanksgiving can never be too much. The reason why you and me are still alive, the relevance of our living on this planet Earth is because we will constantly and consistently give thanks to our creator and maker. What is Thanksgiving? Thanksgiving is the act of showing gratitude all appreciation to God for all he has done. Yes, has he done anything for you? Can you look at yourself this moment and just feel maybe your eyes, your mouth, your hands and just look at what the Lord has done for you. That you are alive and you're watching me right now is part of what the Lord has done. And we're going to thank him. I quickly go to Psalm 73 verse 1. Psalm 73 says, Truly, God is good to Israel. Yes, to Israel as a nation, to you representing your nation and as an individual and as a family, as a, a church, the Lord truly is good. And it goes further to say, even to such as are of a clean heart. Thank God because he's a good God. I quickly joined another second scripture reading to it, which is Psalm 145, verse 9. And it says, The Lord is good to all, and his mercies over uh, and his mercies are over all his works. Yes. You and I, we are the works of God, and we are going to thank the Lord. We are going to thank Him because we are His work. He is the one that created us. We are His handiwork. He molded us. He formed us. Yes, I quickly read the final scripture before we go to thank the Lord. Isaiah 64, verse 8 says, But now, O Lord, Thou art our father, we are the clay, and thou art potter, and we all are the work of, of thy hands. Can you hear that? You are the work of 
God's hand. Yes, because you never sky. The most high created you and I. That is why tonight we're going to return back thanksgiving to him in the name of Jesus. So we'll lift up our voice by thanking God. You know, Thanksgiving is appreciating God and showing gratitude for all he has done. So lift up your voice this hour and begin to thank the Lord. Begin to appreciate him. The Lord, I thank you because I am the work of your hands. Lord, I thank you that I'm alive this hour. Is somebody giving thanks to the almighty God? Lord, I thank you because you are good to all. You are good to all. You are good to all. Ah, Dadiva, I is so tired. Our God is good. It's good to everyone. It's good. It's good in the day. It's good in the night. It's good in the morning, noon, and evening. Father, we exalt you. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you. We appreciate you for being good to us as the work of your hands. Father, we adore you. Father, we thank you. Thank you for being good to me as an individual. Thank you for being good to me as a member of my family. Thank you for being good to me as a member of the body of Christ, the church which I represent. Thank you for being good to me as a member of the nation, even as I am here right now in this nation, the United Kingdom. Father, thank you. Thank you because you're good. Father, thank you for being good to me. Lord, I give you praise. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. We want to quickly thank the Lord again. You know, in thanking God and appreciating him for what he has done, specifically, it's good for us to pinpoint some areas. I'm telling you, fine, there is news of war whatever is on right now but you as an individual in your life you can see peace in your life you can see health around you you can see your family you can see the protection of god around you even in the nation that you have right now that you don't you're not running a task getter let's lift up our voice and just thank god father i want to thank you on behalf of the good health that to be given to me. I want to do on behalf of the peace that is around me, uh, for the peace that I'm enjoying in my nation right now. Father, Lord, I thank you. It is of your doing, Lord, and it's marvelous in my sight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you for protection. Thank you for family. Thank you for keeping us all, our Daddy, in one peace. Father, we want to say thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. All glory and honor be unto you. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. You know, when I read that Psalm 145 verse 9, that says the Lord is good to all. Yes, it doesn't matter. You might be a sinner. You're so terrible. Whatever, you made mistake. You mess up. God is good to all because he is merciful, he is kind, and he wants you to come to him the way you are. He does not condemn. Neither will he write you off. That is why he is good to all. And that same B part says, and his mercy over uh, uh, over all his works. I want us to thank the Lord for his mercy. Ah, Lamentation 3.22 says, it's of the Lord's mercy we are not consumed because his compassion filled us. Let's lift up our voice and thank the Lord for his mercy. Father, I thank you for your mercy. Your mercy over me as an individual. Your mercy over me. Ah, daddy, over my family, over my church. Father, thank you for your mercy that does not condemn me, that does not, that, that, that does not make me sleep and not wake up. Father, thank you for your mercy. You show me mercy all around. You show me mercy in my family, in my nation, in my neighborhood. Father, Lord, I give you praise. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Father, we give you all the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. I want us to lift up a prayer concerning the body of Christ. I want us to thank the Lord. You see, when pandemic came, it thought it could dis dis scatter the church. But here we are. I want us to lift up our voice and begin to thank the Lord. I appreciate God for what he's done for the church. Father, in the name of Jesus, we want to thank you for the body of Christ. Thank you for keeping the church together. That need that we can gather to pray, making an avenue, making this atmosphere that 
we are online we are calling on you worshiping you lord will give you praise help you, father will give you praise finally as i round up i just want to say father thank you lord thank you for your good thank you for your kind thank you for your greatness thank you for your awesome majesty thank you lord for loving us thank you because you're good to all thank you for our nation thank you for your peace thank you for health father we give you all the glory Thank you for answers to prayer. Blessed be your holy name. We love you, Lord. Thank you for tonight. Thank you for all you're set to do. Thank you for touching us. Thank you for saving us, healing us, delivering us. May your name be praised forever. In Jesus' mighty name, I pray. Amen. Thank you.
you pour out your spirit I will open up inside If you provide the fire I'll provide the sacrifice If you pour out your spirit
Hallelujah. Wow, what a song. What a worship. Fill me up till I overflow. If that is your prayer tonight, would you lift your hands to heaven and your voice and tell the Almighty God, fill me up till I overflow. In the name of Jesus, I don't just want to be filled. I want an overflow. The Bible says, it prepares a table before you in the presence of your enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Come on, how many want overflow tonight? Let's go ahead and speak to the Almighty God. Lord, fill me up till I overflow. In the name of Jesus, oh God, fill me up till I overflow. In the name of the Lord, my Father in heaven, I pray, oh God, fill me up till I overflow. In the name of Jesus Christ, Lord, ordinary will not do. The normal would not do. The common would not suffice. I need something extraordinary. I need an overflow. Bible says you are able to do exceeding abundantly above all we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 20. So Lord, fill me up till I overflow, O oh God. The Bible says you give not the measure of the Spirit to Jesus. You think you gave him immeasurably. That is overflow. That is what I want tonight. Lord, I position myself for an overflow of your power. Overflow of your spirit. Overflow of grace. Overflow of your presence. Overflow of an encounter tonight. I thought someone came to seek the face of the Lord in this place. He says, if my people that are called by my name will humble themselves and turn from their weekend day ways and seek my face and pray, the Bible says, then will I turn from heaven and we heal their land. Would you tell the Almighty God, I've come to seek your face on this worship and prayer night. Lord, till I overflow in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Till I overflow, till I overflow in the name of the Lord. How many want overflow on the altar tonight? Come on up. How many want an overflow? Yes. Yes, would you agree with me? I need an overflow. Yes, would you agree right now? I need an overflow. Fill me up. Fill me up. I need a man who can agree with me tonight. Come on. I need a man. I need a man. I need a pastor who can say, fill me to overflow. I need a minister of the gospel who is saying, pastor, I need an overflow tonight. Come on. I need a man who knows and they know that tonight is going to be a special night. I need an overflow. Where are you? you. Come on. Tell the Almighty God, I need an overflow in the name of Jesus Christ. Come on. Where is that young man? Where is that young lady? My God, I need an overflow of your power, of your glory, of your presence, of your pressing Lord. I just want Jesus. Fill me the overflow. Is there any man on this altar who is shouting, I need an upon of your spirit afresh. Fill me till overflow. Fill me till overflow. In Jesus' name we are prayed. Thank God I've got a witness from three men. Glory to God who are positioning and positioned to receive an overflow tonight. Glory to God. I'm sure you know, your, my brother, my sister, that all over Europe there's been this news about an attack, about escalating issues between Russia and Ukraine. We can't be indifferent as Christians. We can't be silent. Moreover, and more so that we have our folks there. We have churches there. We have relatives there. We have students there. We have young people there who are absolutely on fire for the Lord. Our aim is not to choose a side tonight. What we are simply asking is in Psalms chapter 46 and verse 9. Psalms chapter 46 and verse 9. The Bible says, he maketh wars to cease unto the end of the earth. He breaketh the bow 
and cut the spear in sunder. He burned the chariot in fire. Be still and know that I am God. I want us to pray tonight. The Lord made the wars to cease in the name of Jesus Christ. Oh God, make the wars to cease. The biological war, make it to cease. The physical war, make it to cease. Oh God, the economic sabotage, make it to cease. Oh God, Father, we ask you now, let the war cease. Oh God, in Eastern Europe, in the name of Jesus, Master Gadabahande, Nekote Brozotoria Gadabayandosh, Emando Somebody pray like a minute. Lord, let the world cease, oh God. Bible say you make the world to cease. Come on, we call upon you tonight. Oh God, let the world cease. Preserve your people. Preserve your children, oh God. In the name of Jesus, your name is called the Prince of Peace. And so, Lord, we ask you now move upon the heart of the leaders on both sides of the divide, upon the heart of NATO and USA. Let them come to the devil and let the world cease. Father, in the name of the Lord, we don't want losses of life. We don't want casualties, oh God. Let the war cease in Ukraine. Let the escalation come to an end. In the name of Jesus Christ, Bible says you break the bow. Father, break the bow of war. Break it now. Call this peer in sunder. Every weapon of war, call them in asunder, oh God, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and let peace come again. Oh God, oh God, make the wars to cease. War of words, let it cease. War of weapons, let it cease. War of attack, let it cease. Oh God, war of bombing, let it cease. In the name of Jesus, war of stubbornness, Jehovah, let it come to an end. Let it come to an end. In the name of Jesus, Father, break the bow asunder. In the name of the Lord, call them asunder, O God. We now pray, I come to Proverbs chapter 16, 1, 21, verse 1. The heart of kings are in the hand of the Lord. Father, begin to turn the heart of leadership to hear the voice of God, to respond to what God is going to do. In the name of Jesus Christ, weapons of war must come to an end. Father, begin to draw the heart of the people. We declare the name of the Lord Jesus over these nations right now. We declare peace of God over these nations right now in the name of Jesus Father let your peace reign over these nations oh God thank you Abba Father preserve your children oh God Lord bring an opportunity for men to see you as the Prince of Peace bring an opportunity for people to come to know you as the Prince of Peace even in this season oh God in the name of Jesus Christ, Lord, surround your people with the wall of your presence and the wall of your fire. In the name of the Lord, thank you, precious Father. Europe shall have peace again. In Jesus' marvelous name, we are prayed. Can I hear somebody shout the loudest, Amen? Now that's an oxymoron. Can you type? Can you emoji the loudest amen you can? I want to see who's going to have the longest amen. Glory to God. Hallelujah. You believe God has answered prayer? Put your hands together for the Lord. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. Yes, yes. The longest and the sharpest amen. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. Tonight, I'd like to welcome you all to this great altar tonight, our worship and prayer night for the month of February. Thank God for life. Thank God that you and I could see the 25th of the month of February. Glory be to Jesus. Tonight, I'd like you to be attentive. Tonight, I'd like you to be active. Tonight, I'd like you to open your ears and your eyes and begin to see what the Lord is going to do tonight in Jesus' name. For the word of the Lord is going to come to you in the name of Jesus Christ. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 8 and verse 8, Matthew 8, 8, the centurion answered and said, Lord, I'm not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof, but speak the word only and your servant shall be healed. Tonight I know as the word shall be spoken, God, we encounter each and every one of us 
and there shall be a transformation in our lives in Jesus' name. Something unusual will take place in your life and my life in the name of Jesus Christ. Glory to God. I'm very excited tonight because of the speaker of tonight that God has brought. We are so excited, though we couldn't gather physically, but we are here together on this altar. Tonight, the man of God that will be preaching to us is not a stranger in any shape or form. Not to us at Royal Connections and not to us in our organization. By the grace of God, he is the senior pastor of Jesus' house for all nations. Having read law at the University of Warwick, he began his legal career as a barrister and then progressed into investment banking. He was ordained as a pastor in 1993 and became senior pastor of Jesus' house in April of the following year, two months after the church was set up. He has held every position imaginable and possible in the RCCG before now. He also is the chair of several board of trustees, a festival of life, amongst others. Under his leadership, RCG in the UK grew to over 800 parishes. He was also appointed Pentecostal president of churches together in England for a four-year time. By the grace of God, he, he has done what most people of our persuasion and color don't do. They don't leave a position for somebody else to fill in. He's a man that cherishes the presence of God beyond anything. By the grace of God, Pastor Agu is married to his darling wife, Pastor Shola, and they have three children. Ladies and gentlemen, he's a father, he's a mentor, he's an encourager, he's a visionary, but a very humble man and a model for anyone aspiring to be an authentic leader. Real connection tonight, what an honor and a privilege. We have this great man of God that Pastor Grace and I celebrate. Let's make welcome tonight, by the grace of God, the founder of Mandate Men's Ministry, build, dedicated to building men of integrity who are role models in their society, Pastor Agu Iroko. We do love him tonight. Come on, real connection. Let's make him welcome in Jesus' name. God bless you, sir. Hallelujah. Praise God. Um, thank you for giving me this privilege, uh, this opportunity to join you. Um, I admire many things about uh, Pastor Shola and Pastor Grace. Uh, um, as I participated in Pastor Shola's prayer, I was reminded that this is one of the things that I greatly admire about him. Um, there's just a, a grace to pray, an anointing to pray, um, a grace to galvanize others to prayer that rests on him. Um, I think Pastor Shola could actually make a dead man pray uh, with the grace that God has given him. Greetings to you all. Um, we love and appreciate you, Pastor Shola and Pastor Grace. Greetings from um, your namesake, my wife Shola, um, and our children. Uh, it's a privilege to share with you. If we just say a word of prayer, and then we can challenge ourselves with the word of God. So, Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you and bless you for this opportunity to open up ourselves to your person, your spirit. Uh, we thank you for, for the grace to worship you. We thank you for the stirring prayers that have been said already. And we thank you for your word. Your word will, will come into our lives, challenge us, reposition us, lift every burden, break every yoke. Uh, your word will form a catalyst to propel us from where we are to where you intend that we should be in this next season of our lives. Father, we thank you and we bless you. We give you all the praise and all the glory. Please breathe upon the words that are spoken. Let it not be the words of any man, but let it be your word, governized by your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Praise the, praise the Lord. Well, we want to challenge ourselves around the theme, keep the fire burning. Now, um, one of the things I love about the Bible is how 
it just challenges us. I especially love how the Old Testament, while being a literal account of things that took place, also speaks to us with a lot of symbolism about the fulfillment of that word in your life and my life. I love that a lot. So much symbolism there that speaks to us. And um, when we look at the book of Leviticus, it's actually a book of the Bible that most people will skip. When you find people doing a study of Leviticus, then they are really mature, advanced, or very serious. Um, because most of us tend to skip it. Because it's seemingly one of the driest books uh, of the Bible. But I find that Leviticus has a lot of symbolism that speaks very directly into a New Testament church and that explains many of the spiritual truths of our walk with God. And if we turn our Bibles to the sixth chapter of the book of Leviticus, um, in the, in the book of Leviticus, a lot of instructions are given as to ministry to God. Um, a lot of laws and rules as to uh, what was supposed to be done uh, as ministry to God, uh, as, as ministry was undertaken to God. And in the sixth chapter of the book of Leviticus, it starts to talk about what the Bible calls the law of the burnt offering. Um, and um, the instructions from Moses he received from Lord from the Lord was how the children of Israel should take care of how they should go about bringing the burnt offering uh, to the Lord. It says um, from verse nine that the burnt the, the after de declaring this is the law of the burnt offering that the burnt offering shall remain on the altar all night until mo morning. The fire shall be kept burning on the altar. It then talks about. Um, what the priest shall do, take his linen garment, put on his breeches, take up the ashes of what the fire has consumed with the bond offering, put them aside, put them besides the altar, verse, verse 11. And he shall put on his garment, other garments, carry the ashes out outside the camp to a clean place, verse 12. And the fire upon the altar shall be kept burning on it. It shall not be allowed to go out. The priest shall burn wood on it every morning and lay the burnt offering in order upon it, and it shall burn, burn on it the fat of the peace offering. What's the summation of that? Um, it's the law of the burnt offering. This is what the priest is supposed to do. Supposed to take the burnt offering, supposed to work hard day and night to make sure the fire on the altar doesn't go out um, so that it continues to consume the burnt offering. And then he's tasked with the responsibility of making sure that that fire never goes out uh, night or day. Now, there's a lot of symbolism there. Um, the, the, the burnt offering itself, the, this isn't the message for today, but let me just throw this in there. Um, the symbolism of the burnt offering uh, would be our lives and how uh, the, the difficulty of burning out of our lives all the things that are not of God of continuously giving ourselves to God in sacrifice, of growing from day to day, a continuous burning that takes place in our lives as we become purer and purer, more and more like Christ, uh, as we are transformed daily into his image. But where I was going for today, and especially with Royal Connections, is the continuous burning on the altar with the priest working hard to make sure he put the wood all the time, the responsibility that the priest was charged with was that that fire must not go out. Now, what is that fire symbolic of? What is the, the deeper message for a New Testament believer that is looking at the book of Leviticus? We don't do burnt offerings anymore. We don't uh, worship God in that way. The symbolism that must not be lost on us and that is an encouragement to us. And I'm hoping that my message today will encourage us, especially a church like Royal Connections that is steeped in prayer. That the, the, the symbolism of that fire that is never that is never goes that never goes out is 
that that fire is representative, symbolic of the fire of prayer, the incense of prayer that must never cease in our lives. I am of, I am convinced beyond any doubt that Genesis to Revelations, there's one theme that the Bible puts across to us, that we serve a God who answers prayers. I am convinced that the reason we haven't seen an acceleration of the move of, the move of God, the reason we haven't seen a quickening of the plans and purposes of God, the reason that we haven't seen at this point in time a move of the Spirit of God. The reason I think that we haven't seen the revival in the full, a full blown revival like we desire is simply because the church, you and I, haven't raised the quantum of prayer that the heavens require to bring that to pass. I am convinced beyond any doubt that God's default mode for you and I, his children that he loves, is to answer our prayers. I am not saying that he answers every prayer the way we want, but I am saying that he does answer every prayer that is lifted to him and consistently lifted to him. For it not to be that way would mean that I would have challenges with the Bible that is presented to us. Because when you search the Bible, out of the numerous prayers that are lifted up to God, you would probably find that you can categorically say maybe directly three or so prayers were not answered out of thousands of prayers. And if you look at the three or so prayers that were not answered, you're glad that some of them were not answered. Because if some of them had been answered, then it would have totally altered your destiny and my destiny. So the summation is that this book that is presented to us that guides our life is a book where God is trying to get a message across to you and I that I am a God, a father that listens to the cries of my children and I answer prayers. So Royal Connection, I wanted to encourage you tonight that we must keep that fire burning. We must keep that incense going up to God. We don't do it out of religious duty or an obligation. We have, must come to God with a sense that there is a reward. The whole essence of prayer is a reward. In his foundation teaching on prayer, Jesus makes that clear. What you do in secret, your father will reward you openly. The whole essence of prayer is a reward. We don't do we don't do we don't stay, say prayers just to tick a box. We don't say it just to fulfill an obligation. We don't say it so we can say we've gone through a religious ritual. We don't say it so that we can we can say that we have done what we should. The whole essence of prayer must be that we say it, we come there, we lift our voice to God, we petition him, we come with our supplications, we are prostrate before him, we lift our voices early in the morning, late at night, at any time of the day, with an expectation in our hearts that this God that we serve will reward our efforts with an answer to our prayer. That surely must be the case. The scripture is, is the Bible is replete with scriptures that urge us in this way. The Bible says in Jeremiah 33, verse 3, God says, Call unto me, and I will answer and show you great and mighty things which you did not know. He says, I will answer and I will show you some amazing and awesome things. But the thing is that you have to call unto me. So the question we should be asking ourselves is: have we called unto him? Someone might say, Well, I have called, then I will point the person to the golden rule of prayer. Matthew 7, verse 7, ask and you shall receive, seek and you shall find, knock and the door shall be opened unto you. For whosoever, anybody who goes, puts themselves to the asking, the seeking and the knocking will get what the Bible says. The door is opened unto you. And the asking we understand from those 
who make the, made the translation from the Greek to, for, to us in English, we understand that the asking is not a singular act. They tell us that the, the word ask is actually in the continuous tense. It is keep asking until I receive. Keep asking until there's a response. It is keep seeking until I find. It's not just I sought once, but and there was no response, nothing changed. The assurance is keep seeking until you find. The, the, the encouragement is keep knocking until the door gets open. There is a reward. The reward is that I received, that I found that the door was opened unto me. Uh, any other thing would, would be either religious exercise or would be us giving up before we have received the reward. So Royal Connection, I want to, I want to encourage you that you are a praying church. Your prayers cannot be in vain. Your pastors are praying pastors. It is impossible for their prayers to be in vain. For that to be the case, then this Bible is not the book that we say that it is. We have an assurance from our Heavenly Father, the creator of the ends of the earth, that as long as we keep that fire burning, that incense rising to him, as long as as the priests, we are diligent in our work of constantly putting wood into the fire. And you can imagine how difficult that was for the priests. They had to constantly keep putting wood into the fire in the same way that we must constantly keep coming to that place of prayer. But we come with an expectation in our hearts that the Bible has confirmed to us that we serve a God who answers prayers. Jeremiah 29 verse 12 is the same thing that God is saying. Come and pray to me and you will see what I will do. I will hear you and I will answer your prayer. And so that's the picture that is painted for us, the symbolism. Of course, there was a, a literal dimension to it. There were instructions that were given at that particular time that were applicable as a law to how the burnt offering was offered to God. But there was a deeper symbolism that has deeper spiritual connotations for you and I. It was a picture of prayer that the incense must keep rising to God. And that when that is the case, then we must come with expectation that there will be an answer to that. And that kind of leads me to where I wanted to go today, um, starting in that, that, symbolic, that symbolism in the Old Testament to an injunction that Jesus gave us that surely must be connected to that. And if you turn it with me in your Bibles to Luke, the 18th chapter, and if you permit me, I want to read that chapter from the Amplified Classic, but you can read it from whatever version you have, the Amplified Classic. Tonight, I want to encourage someone. You were on the verge of giving up. You wondered how long. You wondered when. You wondered another year has started and it hasn't happened. He doesn't seem to have heard. Is he listening to you? Um, you're about to grow weary. You're tired. Hope seems to have been deferred. I wanted to bring an encouragement to you, Royal Connection, that keep the fire burning. It, it, I suspect it is closer than you think. Your answer, the reward, is closer than you think. In Luke's Gospel, the 18th chapter, and Jesus tells his disciples a parable, and this is the Amplified Classic Version. And Jesus told them a parable to the effect that they ought always to pray and not to turn coward, faint, lose heart, and give up. He said to them, in a certain city, there was a judge who neither reverenced and feared God, nor respected or considered man. And there was a widow in that city who kept coming to him saying, protect and defend and give me justice against my adversary. And for a time he would not. But later he said to himself, though I have neither reverence or fear for God, nor respect or consideration for man, yet because this widow continues to bother me, I will defend and protect and avenge her, lest she give me intolerable annoyance and wear me out by her continual coming, or at the last she come and rail on me or assault me or strangle me. Then the Lord said, listen, Royal Connection, to what the unjust judge says. Yeah, I, I just love that phrase. He tells a story and we'll look into the story. And then he says, now listen, pay attention 
analyze critically. Understand what the judge says. Because what he's saying by import is that if you understand what the judge says, it's about to totally change your life, certainly to totally change your prayer life. He says, listen to what the unjust judge says. And then he goes on to make this profound statement. And will not our just God defend and protect and avenge his elect, his chosen ones, people in royal connections? Will not our just God defend you, protect you, avenge you, you his elect, his chosen his precious ones, the apple of his eyes, who cry out to him day and night. Will he defer them and delay help on their behalf? And then as if to confirm, just in case we have missed it, he, Jesus says, I tell you, and that's the message I bring to you, Royal Connections. I tell you, not because I'm saying it, but because Jesus says it, and he's saying it to someone on this platform. He says, I tell you, he, our heavenly father, will defend and protect and avenge them speedily. It's not a delayed thing. For someone, it is speedily. It is sooner than you think. It is round the corner. It is not as far as you think. You have gone three quarters of the way. How can you give up at this point in time? You have spent nights in prayers, mornings in prayers. Pastor Shola is always having prayer meetings. You have been diligent in the prayer meetings. It, how can it be that you have paid such a price and yet we believe that somehow the enemy is telling you a lie that God cannot do it? I tell you, that is not your father and it is not my father. On the authority of his word, I, come, I came to tell you this evening that it is nearer than you think. Just keep the fire burning. So go back to our story. Jesus tells them a parable. And he tells them, the Bible tells us, he tells them the reason why he's telling them the parable. And you know, Jesus' most profound teachings came as stories. That's why the best Bible teachers are those who can tell stories. So he tells them a parable. He, he wants them to never forget it. That's why he tells it to them as a parable, as a story. The whole essence of a parable is a story that drives home a spiritual truth in relation to Jesus and the Bible. So he tells them a parable. And then the Bible tells us why he tells them a parable. He tells them a parable so that they can always pray. So the whole essence of this parable is to keep the fire burning. He tells them a, a parable to make sure that they keep stoking the fire, putting the wood in the fire, irrespective of what is happening, irrespective of what the circumstances are saying. He tells them something that will galvanize them, encourage them, lift them up from where maybe circumstances have knocked them down. Something that will excite them, get them expectant, waiting for a reward. He tells them a parable that they should always pray and that they should not turn coward. They should not become faint, lose heart or give up. Now, why was he telling them this parable? Because he knew that the whole process of prayer, believing God, waiting for an answer, sometimes having circumstances that are telling you and your prayer that it can't happen and it won't happen. He knew that in the normal course of our Christian life, as we bring petitions and requests and supplications and prayers to him, that there's ample opportunity for us to get tired, to get weary, to maybe become cowardly in the sense of being afraid, to faint and ultimately to give up. So this was his charge to them, but also to us, that whatever happens, you mustn't let that fire go out. You must keep praying. And so he encourages them with this story. But before I go into the story very quickly, let me tell you very quickly some of the things that make us turn coward, give up, uh, become faint, become weary, you know, throw in the towel, sometimes get to a point where we're just going through the re religious ritual. What are some of these things? Very quickly. 
Number one, of course, the big one is unbelief, where we are going through the motions, but we don't believe that God is hearing and that God will answer. Sometimes it's because we, you know, there's a, there's a way that we do things because we have done them. There's a way that in our mental realm, we know that this is the right thing to do. After all, I'm a Christian. I've been a Christian for so long. What am I supposed to do? I have to pray. But there isn't the expectation in our hearts that God will. Hebrews 11 verse 6 is a scripture I love. I love the scripture. Without faith, without trusting God, without believing God, it is impossible to please him. For he that comes to God must believe that God is. It's the basis. We believe that God is. And you can expand that God is. That God is who he says he is. God is who the Bible says he is. God, the testimony of God in the word of God is true. We believe that God is. He is all-powerful, all-knowing. He's the God who can do the impossible. Nothing is impossible for him. All power belongs to him. We believe that that's the God that we are coming to in prayer. Not the creation of our minds. Not the creation of theologians. Not the creation of even some pastors who have created a kind of God that is not the God of the Bible. Not the, not the creation of people who have created a God who is judgmental, who, who, who will hit us at the, slightest in, in, at the slightest mistake we make. No, the God of the Bible, a God of grace, a God of mercy, a God who is love, that God is, a God who calls us his children. Our spirits cry out, Abba, Father, dear Father. Our spirits testify to us, even when our minds are saying the opposite, that this is who he is, our Father. That we believe that God is. But then secondly, that he is a rewarder of them who diligently seek him. We must believe that. We must believe that all these prayer meetings, Pastor Shala is permanently praying. He's not doing it because he wants fame as a man of prayer. Pastor Grace wants to be known as a woman who challenges us in prayer. No, he's doing it because in his heart he believes that it works. God answers prayers. Now, like I said, he might not answer it how you want. Even his son Jesus cried out to him. It was a prayer. Father, let this cup pass from me. But God said, it's not the plan. It's not the purpose. And you know it's not the plan and it's not the purpose. I understand that the pressure of the moment, you're about to take on the sin of the world, has driven you to a place where you're lifting a prayer to me that you know I will not answer. I will not answer that prayer. The answer to that prayer was God not answering that prayer. The answer to that prayer was God sending grace for him to continue to carry the weight and to go to the cross. If God had answered that petition of his son, then you and I will not be saved. So of course he answers all our prayers. He might not answer it the way we want, but answer he will. We must believe that, that when we seek God, he's a rewarder of them who diligently seek him. And, you know, I say to people all the time that the beauty about prayer is that you come to God with a petition, a request. You know, God, give me this, give me that, answer this. And when what we get is actually twofold. We get his answer. But, brothers and sisters, what we get that is even more than his answer is that we get God. No one has sought to face God, to seek God in prayer that has not got more of God. We come out of that session, we come out of that period with a deeper knowledge of God, a deeper understanding of God, more appreciation of a relationship, a deeper intimacy with him. It makes whatever it is that we wanted actually pale because in addition to what we asked for, we have got more of God and that's surely better. So the first thing, of course, that's a challenge is our unbelief, that we come to God and we don't really, we go through the ritual, but we don't really believe. I want to encourage you, Royal Connections, Let's enter another level of faith. Let's enter another level of trust in him. Let's just find in his word that he says it. And let's like children just believe that God who said this, he's going to bring it to pass. Is that not the testimony of the patriarch of our faith, Abraham? And I love the way the Bible puts it. 
in, in Romans, the fourth chapter, the 19th to 21st verse. And not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body already dead since he was about 100 years old and the deadness of Sarah's womb. You can, you, can, you, can, you can put that in any dimension you like in relation to your life. He didn't consider what the doctor said. He didn't consider what the economy said. He didn't consider the, the things were actually factually telling him what you are asking is not possible. And I'm sure I'm speaking to someone who is fact, has factually been told, factually, it is a fact. A woman who is that age cannot have a child. Her womb is dead. It is factual. The best doctors in the world will say that her womb is dead. That's where our, the patriarch of our faith was. But the Bible says he did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief. God had made him a promise. My sister, has God made you a promise? I'm not talking about the logos, the written word. Thank God for that. But I'm talking about a rema. I'm talking about when the spirit of God has come upon a word and has taken that out of the book and has personalized it for you. You know that God has spoken it. I'm talking about when your pastor spoke a word from the pulpit and there were, there were a thousand plus people there. But you knew because the spirit took that word and branded your heart with it. You knew that that promise of God has been personalized by the spirit for you. Has God given you a promise like that? Then I'm saying to you, don't waver through unbelief. But like the patriarch of our faith, be strengthened in faith. Give glory to God and be convinced that what he's promised, he is able to perform. That's the testimony of the patriarch of our faith. That's how we come to God in prayer. That's how we take a scripture. It's, it's first is the logos, is the written word of God. That in itself is powerful. But as we meditate on it, as we pray into that scripture, then the Spirit of God breathes upon that scripture. And what I call a combustion takes place in a person. And the person who knelt down to pray is not the person who got up from that kneeling position. Because a combustion has taken place. The Logos has become a rema. And that person knows, like Abraham, the womb might be dead. I might be too old. But God has said, and it will surely come to pass. I know I can't hear you, but wherever you are, can someone say an amen? Or as Pastor Shola said, I learned that one from him. Can you type the amen into the chat? Of course, the first thing is unbelief. The second thing is doubt. These are the things that Jesus was working against when he said you, you mustn't grow faint, weary. That you, mu that you mustn't let doubt keep creep in. That we must understand this whole, this whole process of prayer. The writer says in Hebrews the 11th, the 4th chapter and the 6th verse, let us come boldly. Now, there must be something that is making us come boldly. And of course there is. It's the finished work of our high priest that gives us a boldness. The boldness is not because of us, but it's because of what our high priest has done and what our high priest continues to do. Uh, what our high priest did in the finished work of Calvary what our high priest did in ascending to heaven, what our high priest is doing in sitting on the right-hand side of God and engaging in the only ministry that he's engaging in. There were the two ministries that he's engaging in now. The ministry of representation, where he's representing us constantly before God, and the ministry of intercession. So our high priest, thank God for prayer meetings. Thank God you know, when Pastor Shola says, I want to pray with, I want to pray for you personally, we are very excited. When, of course, uh, our General Vasia says, I want to pray for you personally, send me that personal prayer request. Some people are so, they are, they are excited, they even forget to pray themselves. And you might be a bit excited if I said, I wanted to pray for you personally, I send me your prayer request. But all of us pale into insignificance because the message for you, my brother and my sister, is that Jesus says to you, I'm going to pray for you personally. I'm going to intercede on your behalf. What does the Bible say? He's seated on the right hand of God, making intercession for us. As you're praying, he's, he's hearing your prayer. He's echoing it into God's ear. He doesn't have to go far. He's on the right hand of God. He leans over and whispers to God. Have you heard what she's saying? Have you heard her cry? 
Haven't you seen her again this morning? Isn't it time that we answered her? Her case has merit. And even, even if it doesn't have merit, I am making representation for her by the finished work of Calvary, by the blood that I shed for her. That's the kind of intercessor we have in our high priest. That's why this nonsense of human beings being high priests is just Old Testament religion. None of us is capable of being your high priest. There is no intermediary between man and God apart from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And he's doing such a good job that you don't need another man or woman to be an intermediary. The best that we can be is we can be shepherds and signposts towards God, but never must another human being position themselves as an intermediary between you and God. To do that and to accept that is to nullify the job that Jesus is doing, the perfect job that he's doing in heaven. Can someone say amen to that? So Royal Connections, I'm encouraging you, put doubt aside. Put it aside. Trust God. Don't be double-minded. That scripture says we come boldly before a throne of grace. It tells us it's a throne of grace. Thank God for that, Shola, Pastor Shola. Thank God, Pastor Grace. Thank God that it's a, it's a throne of grace. I don't come there because I have merit. I come there because I just don't even deserve to be there. But it's a throne of grace. It's not a throne of judgment. It's not a throne where I'm going to be condemned. It's a throne of grace. Since we come before a throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. What do we obtain at that throne? It is grace and mercy. I come boldly. It can change to a throne of judgment or a throne of condemnation. So I can come boldly and know that the scepter that is stretched out to my hand to, to touch my shoulder is not a sword to cut my head off. It's a scepter that anoints me with grace, unmerited favor, and that I have a guarantee that I will leave that place of prayer with the grace and the mercy that will help me in that time of need. Number three, the third thing that, that you know Jesus was warning us against were distractions. That's, that's, a, that's a, the third thing that trips us up in prayer. We start well, but the enemy is an expert at distractions. Is his stock in trade. Yeah, that's how he operates. His MO, uh, his modus operandi, his way of operating. Once he knows that, hang on a second, this girl is serious. She actually listened to what Pastor Shola said. And she's really serious about facing this prayer. We better find some distractions. Age-old strategy. Exodus 5, verses 6 to 9. You know the story. The children of Israel came to Pharaoh. Um, Moses came on their behalf that, look, we want to go and worship our God. We want to go and pray to him and worship him. You know, and, and you know, we want to develop our relationship with him. What was Pharaoh's response? Pharaoh's response was to call his taskmasters. His thinking was simple. They are talking this nonsense about prayer, this nonsense about early morning prayer. Pastor Shola wants to pray at 5 a.m., 6 a.m., all this uh, time. They are only waking up because they did not sleep late with issues, tired, fatigued, distracted, programs on television they shouldn't be watching, calls they should not be making, talking for one, two, three hours to people they should not be talking to for so long, receiving toxic information as a result of, of the conversations. The only reason they're talking about waking up at five is because they didn't sleep at 3 a.m. Let them have sleepless nights. Let them toss and turn. Give them weights and troubles and problems and burdens. Let them call them from all over the world with issues that they cannot solve. Make them tired. And then when they are that tired, they will not talk this nonsense about following that man and his wife to be waking up at 5 a.m. They wake up at, at 8 o'clock, rushing to the tube station to go to work or trying to get to a, a device to connect to work. They will forget this nonsense about prayer. It's because they are not distracted. Distract them. And what was his, what was his instruction? Let them make the same number of bricks, but don't give them any straw. By the time they walk around this countryside looking for straw, when they get back and sleep at night, they will be so exhausted, this nonsense about going to worship God and praying to God will stop. Is an age-old thing. So the moment we start to see those distractions, we should know that the enemy has gone into operation, that he's trying to distract us. One quarrel here, one friend who's not talking to you. Long meetings about the friend who's not talking to you. 
One, well, uh, the wife becomes cantankerous. The husband becomes obnoxious. Uh, we are now quarreling. We sleep at night. We are not talking to each other. We used to sleep face to face. Now we are sleeping back to back. We wake up in the morning. The child is ill. The, the other child is uh, having problems at school. You, you go to the church. The people in church said, the pastor wore red socks. The wife wore pink hat. You know, and the problems. And then on the phone discussing the red hat and the pink hat of the pastor and the dress of the girl and the, the, the bit of gossip, a bit of toxicity. And before you know what's happening, the whole prayer just totally collapses. And that's, an, that's the enemy's work. Jesus was warning us against that. The fourth thing he was warning us against was delay. Learning to handle what we call delay. The Bible says in Proverbs 13, verse 12, hope deferred makes the heart sick. Hope deferred has the capacity to make the heart sick. So what is the antidote to that? We must never let our heart get to a point where we say hope has been deferred. We must always believe that what God says, there is a timing for it in heaven and he is working according to his timing. Ecclesiastes verse three, Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes chapter three, verse one. There is a timetable of heaven. It might not have come now, but I don't serve a God who is so wicked as to allow me to operate out of time. And if it is an enemy that is trying to do that, then the spirit of God will let me know this is what I am dealing with. But I will not allow the enemy to rob me of hope. Can someone declare that? That the enemy will never steal the hope that God has put in my heart. My expectation will not be cut off in the name of Jesus. They say delay is not denial. I never make that statement. There is no delay with God. I am working according to the timetable of God. He makes all things beautiful in his time. Number five is discouragement. And what I say to discouragement is that the antidote to that discouragement is to make sure I'm encouraged. The psalmist was an expert at that. When his, when his mind wants to discourage him, he commands his mind, he commands his spirit, he commands himself to praise the Lord. He encourages himself in the word of God. Sometimes people might not be able to help you. Learn to encourage yourself. You know, in a practical sense, believe me, find what makes you feel good when things hit you and do it. You know, my wife knows that, of course, number one will be prayer for us. But there are other things that are practical. When the world, shall I, when the world is caving in on me, my wife can tell you what he's going to do. She said he will pray, he will sleep, and then he will go out on his own and eat a good meal. When I finish eating a good meal and I come out, the world has changed. It's in a better place for a nice meal on my own. It's my own therapy. I don't need anybody there. By the time I come out, I think mm, the problem is not as bad. Let us go and face it. So you just find what lifts your spirit. For some people, you know, they, they take a walk in the park. Uh, they, you know, I don't know what people do. You know, some people go and watch a, a, a musical. You know, I mean, some people find a friend and just chat bland, bland conversations that just make them laugh. They reminisce. Whatever it is, all that is part of the armory that God has given you to make sure that you're not discouraged. You can't afford to be discouraged. Encourage yourself. Read the word. Speak it back to yourself. You know, imagine things. Use your mind. See yourself by, by the Spirit of God where you're going to go. Encourage yourself in whatever way you can. I can't tell you what encourages you. I know what encourages me. A few days ago, we were overwhelmed with the with the amount of work. I stepped down from one or two from some positions and thought I would have I'd be having a holiday. The work has gone to another level. I was so overwhelmed two days ago, so overwhelmed, working flat out. 
that at about three o'clock, I just got up. My wife said, where are you going? I said, I'm going to that steakhouse. She started laughing. I said, that's where I'm going. I'm going to sit in that steakhouse. I'm going to order a nice steak and some Cornish crab. I know exactly what I want. I'm going to be on my own. I'm going to talk to the waiters, eat my steak, and I'm going to come back home to face these issues. By the time I came back home, I was whistling, ready for whatever was coming. It wasn't deeply spiritual, but it, I found out that it was the therapy, part of the therapy that works for me. In that solitude, in that place, I jotted down a few things, thought about a few things, and suddenly the world was a better place. So what am I trying to say to you? Whatever happens, you must not be discouraged. You must make sure you're not discouraged. And then number six, as I come to an end of this, and then I'll tell you a few things and then we're done. Am I still within my time? Am I still within my time? Yes, I think so. Okay. Praise God. Maybe maybe my handlers can tell me if I'm within my time. Yeah, my handlers. Yes? Okay, fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. The sixth thing is that you must avoid physical exhaustion. The enemy, he's a character, this devil. He is a sly, scheming, sinister, devious, wicked, evil, manipulative character. He knows. Shall I know what I'm talking about? He just has to get us physically exhausted. And sometimes we are our own worst enemies because we, we, we wear a worldly badge. You know, there's just something about letting people know that I work very hard. I don't, I don't sleep like normal people. I only have a few hours sleep a night. My plate is always full. I'm a very busy person. Now, I've come to realize those things are signs of disorganization. You have a problem. If you're not sleeping well, you have a problem. You, there's too much on your plate. And I'm speaking to myself. You know, I'm preaching to myself. You cannot be sleeping for three or four hours every night. It is unnatural. There is something medically that happens when you sleep that you're missing. Your body repairs itself. Your brain cells regenerate themselves. You are sharper for God because you slept for seven hours a night minimum, at least seven hours a night. You are sharper for God. You are you're going to prolong your life. You're not going to go to heaven sooner and have Peter, the, 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 I have the, um, any of the archangels, I have Michael or any of the disciples asking you why you came at this point in time because you're not supposed to be here because you abused your body. So let's throw that macho stuff away that I'm doing vigils every night so I don't sleep. No, you are disorganized. That's why you don't sleep. God gave us 24 hours. Arrange the 24 hours so that you can pray in the 24 hours. That's not to say there's not the one-off time where, or where you know, once a week or whatever it is, I'm having a vigil. But if you're not sleeping all night, uh, then you're killing yourself slowly. So let's understand that to protect ourselves physically, to ensure that we, we, we play our part in allowing this body to fulfill God's assignment is a responsibility. Let's appreciate that, that there's nothing super spiritual about not exercising. No, it is irresponsible not to. And you know, the religion that we find ourselves in is very interesting. Someone drinks a glass of wine and we look at that person. That person cannot be so spiritual. But then we eat food that is laden with cholesterol, laden with sugar. And somehow in our minds, we don't understand that that person that's drinking a glass of wine even has a biblical basis for it. But you that is taking all this sugar, you are destroying the temple worse than that person because that person could even anchor that glass of wine on some scripture. But you can't anchor the sugar that is destroying the temple on any scripture. Let's understand that and get out of religion and begin to understand that it is, it is looking after the temple, the sleeping, the drinking of water, the exercise. And we're not exercising for a six pack. No amount of exercise I do now is going to give me a six pack. But we're exercising because it's a responsibility. We're taking a walk, whatever it is that you do, because it's a responsibility. 
We are responsible. We are cutting out sugar because it's a responsibility. We're drinking water because it's a responsibility. We're sleeping on time because it's a responsibility. So let's understand that. You know, I love this story in, in 1 Kings, the 19th chapter. Uh, 1 Kings, the 19th chapter, verses 5 to 8. Now, Elijah is knackered. He is tired. He is burnt out. Shall I'm sure you understand what I'm saying. <laughs> Me and you find ourselves there too many times. Shall I? We need to caution ourselves too many times. You know, it's just, it's, it's, it's the downside of, of people who have shepherd's heart the way we have. Pastor Grace, I'm sure you'll understand. I'm sure you've, there are many times you've said to your husband, you are overdoing it. You're not Superman. We find ourselves there. You know, you've got a, a rigorous schedule. You, you've preached back to back, back to back. You know, you've canceled back to back. You, you, you know, you've really stretched yourself. You know, I did that recently. That's why I was overwhelmed. That's behaving like, a, like, so Shola told me, Shola said to me, Agu, you are seven, not 25. You cannot be behaving like this. I jumped off a plane, on a plane, on a helicopter, off a helicopter, on this one, off of that, into mission fields all over the place. I was, and I was feeling good because we're achieving results, 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 results. When I came back, for two days, I couldn't move. I just could not move. I was so exhausted and overwhelmed. So she said to me, you're not 25, <laughs> you are 57. So you better organize yourself. And we've got to accept that. You'll be responsible, understand the times. And understand that spirituality is not just I'm praying or I'm worshiping. Thank God, that's that's all. Oh, those are obvious. But part of our spirituality is how we look after ourselves. So listen to what happens. E Elijah is tired. Now go with Elijah. He has climbed mountains. He has prayed nonstop. He has he has had a dwell with nine hundred prophets of of Baal and Ashtaroth. You know, he has been in confrontations, intense spiritual activity, calling down fire. You know, the, just, the, just the emotional weight of what he went through, the dwell with the prophets, that alone, the man finished and he was tired. Then he heard Jezebel was after him and he started to run. After a while, the man was just physically tired, emotionally drained spiritually just just on empty on every side and then he sat down and lay and slept under the juniper tree the broom tree and then an angel touches him and said to him arise and pray some more fast elijah you need to do something spiritual you can't be tired man of god prophet to the nation get up and pray some more was that what the angel said to him? The angel said to him, arise and eat. That's what God said to me. Go and eat that steak. Because right now, you need that steak. Some of you thought it wasn't spiritual. But if, if God could tell Elijah, arise and eat, don't you think God could have told Aguiruku, go to that steakhouse? You're, you're tired. You've been at this... I'd, 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 had, I'd had like five hours of straight meetings coming back from a crazy travel schedule. Arise and eat. You know, these religious people make us think that that's not, that's not spiritual. The angel told him, arise and eat. And they didn't just tell him, they provided the food. They baked a cake on nice coals. I can imagine that cake. The cake would have been the aroma. <coughs> Excuse me. The aroma, the appeal of the cake. They baked it by his head. And then they put a jar of water. It was so appealing. The man was tired. He could not have had another prayer meeting. He could not have, he could not have done any of those things. So they said to him, eat the food. That's the spiritual instruction from God. Eat the food now. So he ate the food and he drank the water. Guess what? The man was so tired, Shola, that he ate and drank and just fell asleep again. The man was useless to God at that point in time. God said, we better sort this man out. He cannot help our case. And then the angel came back the second time and woke him up. Guess what the angel said to him? You've eaten a bit. Now let's go into deep intercession. 
Seven hours of non-stop praying in tongues. You have to deal with devils, demons, bind, lose, uproot. The angel said to you, wake up, wake up, eat again. What you need is food, food. Your physical body is gone. And so the angel touches him and says, and eat again, because the journey ahead is too great. You don't need any prayer now. You don't need anyone to lay hands on you. You just need food. Some of us, you just need rest. Rest. Stop. You've bound and bound and bound and bound and bound. You've loosed and loosed and loosed. Just sleep well one night. When you wake up the next morning, the world will be a better place. Go on a retreat. You know, take your wife on a drive. That's spiritual enough. Go drive and see the countryside. You know, go and walk and hold your wife's hand again. You prayed so much, you've forgotten how to hold her hand. You're just so mega spiritual now, nobody can touch you. Go and become, become human. There's nothing wrong with it. The divine and the human exist side by side. So go and do something that heaven endorses is spiritual. Yeah, go and do it. Go and walk in the West and walk in a park. I don't know what, you know, drive your car, you know, somewhere. Go and park somewhere and have a picnic with your wife or your husband or whatever it is. Make breakfast in bed for a change. Make breakfast in bed on Saturday. Just say, lie in bed and eat breakfast and throw the plates and the tray next to you and fall asleep again. That's the spiritual instruction that they called Pastor Agu to give you. He says, that what this man came to tell us, not to pray for seven hours. You have tried for seven hours. To, tomorrow, just have breakfast in bed. Just do something that, that helps you in terms of your physical exhaustion, if you're at that place of physical exhaustion. And then he, he arose and ate and drank. And when he obeyed that instruction concerning his body, the Bible says he went in the strength of that food for 40 days. Can someone say amen to that? And as I end, let me end on this note. Back to our story. The story tells us about three main actors. Well, four actors, yeah? The first one, of course, that overrides everything is God. Yeah, he's mentioned in there. Uh, it's obvious he's the main, main person. Then there are three actors that act out this script that are critical, and each one of them tells us a story. So if we take the first one, that is God, yeah? And... I don't have to belabor that. I'm now running out of my time. So I don't have to belabor God. We know um, who he is. Uh, the word tells us who he is. Uh, you know, he's, he's, he is love. He's all powerful. He's all knowing. He's all seen. He's uh, everlasting. It tells us about the grace and mercy that he has poured out on us. So there is God. But then it tells us about three other characters. And each one is very important. First one is the judge yeah so there's this judge <laughs> he paints a picture of this judge it, it, it's all jesus trying to drive home a point he says this judge has no respect for god no reverence for god and no respect or consideration for man he says this judge is as hard as nails he does not have a heart. Compassion is alien to him. Mercy does not come into his territory. He is as hard, as callous as you can imagine. He paints a picture of this judge. But as hard and as callous as he is, he also has power in his hands to make a decision that affects those who come before him cases that are brought to him. And then he says, there's a second character in this plot, a widow. And the widow is chosen by Jesus intentionally because what he wants to portray is in those days, he wants to portray weakness. Somebody who is at the bottom of the ladder. And in those days, a widow was portrayed in that light. She didn't have a husband to protect her. Um, 
she could be taken advantage of. And in this case, there's no way the widow would have known the protocol of the court. How do I approach the judge? I can't pay, I don't, I, I don't, I, I'm so poor, I cannot get a lawyer to represent me. And they don't, they've never allowed people like me near their courts. I don't know the protocol of the court. I am helpless. And the third character was an adversary. And the mandate of the adversary is made clear. It was injustice against the widow. It could easily have been John 10 verse 10, stealing, killing, and destroying. And so these three characters are presented to us. And a story is told. And I want to end as I tell this story. Please just stay with me for a few minutes. The widow, helpless, ignorant of the protocol to approach the judge. Only thing she has is her mouth and her voice. And she starts a plea. Grant me justice against my adversary. The Amplified says, defend, protect, and avenge me. Somebody say that. Defend, protect, and avenge me. I am helpless. I don't understand the protocol. I don't know what to do. I don't know how to do it. But I know one thing. I've been treated unfairly by my adversary. Grant me justice. And the only thing she has is her mouth to petition. And so she starts petitioning. Of course, initially, as the Bible says, the judge is not interested. He doesn't even have the capacity to be interested. This is a nuisance of a woman. Keep Get her away from me. He's not, he, he's not inclined whatsoever to listen to what she has to say. And at this point, the adversary is laughing at her because the adversary is saying, you don't know how to go to him. You have no one to represent you. Your case will never be heard. But the woman does one thing, and this was the crux of Jesus' message. The woman is consistent and persistent in her petition. That's what Jesus was trying to drive across to us. Don't stop. Don't give up. The Bible says it was actually night and day. That's the, what the Bible the, the, the implicit um, um, story in the Bible. The woman gave the judge no rest. Now, can you imagine it? This judge is heartless. The woman starts in the morning. She follows him to his chambers. He's outside his window. He arrives back home. She's at his gate. He goes to sleep. She's still there. She doesn't even change her prayer. And guys, incidentally, people say to me, can you pray? What? We're praying the same thing. Is it a lack of faith? Absolutely not. I'm praying till I get my reward. I have faith I will get my reward. And until the Holy Spirit tells me to stop praying, I will pray the same point, the same prayer, the same thing. God will hear it in the morning, hear it in the afternoon, hear it. I'm following the, the example. He will hear it at night. And if he hasn't answered me, the next morning, I will come back to him. And in the afternoon, I will say it again. And at night, I will say it again. And the next morning, I will say it again. That's the, mo that's the moral of that story. And she goes on and on. And listen to what the man says. The Bible says, and for a time he would not. But later he said to himself. Now this is a man who does not care about anybody. So he's doing it for himself, not for her. He's doing it out of selfishness. He says to himself. I don't have reverence or fear for God. I don't have respect or consideration for man. Yet, because this widow continues to bother me, I will defend and protect and avenge her. Can you beat that? He says, I'm going to do it. I've decided I will do it. And I'm not doing it because of this woman. She's a nuisance. I'm doing it because this woman wants to drive me around the bend. He says, I will, I will do that 
lest she give me intolerable annoyance and wear me out by her continual coming, or at last she come and rail on me or assault me or strangle me. So this woman, what was he saying? This woman is going to kill me. So before she kills me, let me give her what she wants so I can have peace of mind. And then Jesus says, now, listen to what the unjust judge said. Now, what is he saying there? He's putting side by side with the unjust judge. As he says, will not our just God defend, protect, and avenge his elect? You're not the widow. You are his elect. You are his chosen. You are precious to him. He, his son died for you. You are bought by the precious blood. You're not the widow at all. You are the child of the Most High God. He is your father. And God is not the judge. He's a God of love, a God of mercy, a God of compassion. And you don't have to know the protocol to approach God. You have a guide in the Holy Spirit who will tell you what the protocol is to approach God. Your case is different from the widow. As bad as the widow's case was, she got what she wanted. Royal connections. How can you and I not get what we should get? How can we not be avenged, be protected? How can we not be defended? How can our just petitions that are based on the promise of a God who never lies, how can he not respond to them? I want you to get excited that you are entering a season where there will be a harvest of seeds that you have sowed. This church has sowed so many seeds in prayer. Seeds must come. There's a time when the seeds must grow to trees. The trees must give fruit and the fruits must be harvested. And I declare to you, Royal Connections, that in spite of what's happening around, your season of harvesting has come. I declare to you, not as a religious cliche, cliche, but as what I sense in my spirit, that a lot of the efforts of your pastors, are at, you're entering the season where you will be yielding fruits. I, I declare to you, as I said to someone, that there's a stream of favor that is now flowing through the body of Christ and that by God's grace, his spirit will lift you and put you in that stream of favor. You're not the widow. You're the precious, cherished child of God the apple of his eye. God is not the judge. He is your father. He says, I am love. He says that he's full, full of mercy. He says he looks around for those that he can show mercy. He says he kisses some people with mercy. That, that's the God that's your father. The only person there who is the same is the adversary. He's wicked. He's selfish. He's callous. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But as long as you, are, you continue to burn the fire. Keep the fire burning. Believe me, it is sooner than you think that you will have that testimony that you're believing for, especially as it lines up with the word of God and especially as it has a kingdom dimension to it. So it's not just to consume it on our own losses. Father, we thank you and we bless you. We glorify your name. I hope you were encouraged in some way as we pray. Almighty and everlasting God, the sign of a word that is spoken by your spirit is that signs and wonders follow it. Lord, I'm praying that there will be signs and wonders that follow this word. I pray that there's a transformation, Heavenly Father, uh, in the lives of your children. I pray, Father, that the desire of their spiritual parents, of Shola and Grace, the desire of their pastors, Heavenly Father, for them, O oh God, will bear fruit in this season. I pray, Father, that the prayers that this church has said over the years, Father, will not be in vain, cannot be in vain, and that the, their season of harvest has come. I pray, Father, that that stream of favor that you showed me, that this church will be in that stream of favor, Heavenly Father. Father, I just thank you and I bless you. And there might be someone out there you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Everything I said is predicated on one thing, and that is a relationship with Christ. And so if you don't have that relationship, I'm not even asking you
to join a church. I'm not asking you to join Royal Connections as good as that church is. I'm asking you first to get into a relationship with Jesus. And then, of course, the second thing is the joining of a church to help you grow. But primarily, it's about yourself, your destiny, your future, about where you end up in this life and at the end of this life. And the only way that you can guarantee the insurance you have that you will end up in the right place is a relationship with Jesus Christ. The insurance you have that, that your life here on earth Will, that the burden will be taken off you. The way will be pointed out to you is a relationship with Jesus. And if you don't have that, what a perfect opportunity for you to start that relationship. And so wherever you are, if you would just open up your heart and receive him into your heart as your Lord and Savior. And why don't you just say that simple prayer that, that shows that you have genuinely received him, meaning every word, Heavenly Father, Tonight, I receive your son, Jesus, into my life as my Lord and my Savior. I make a, decide, I make a decision tonight by your grace to turn away from anything that is displeasing to you. As I embrace tonight a life of obedience to you, in the name of your son, Jesus. I declare, Heavenly Father, by this prayer, that as you receive me into your family tonight, I am born tonight into your family. Therefore, I am born again tonight, Heavenly Father. And I thank you, Almighty and Everlasting God. In Jesus' name, Amen and Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Well, thank you for having me. Um, and thank you for giving me a chance to share my heart. I, I genuinely appreciate uh, you, all of you. I appreciate your pastor, your pastors, uh, Pastor Shola and Grace, uh, and the work they're doing, not just in Royal Connections, uh, the work they're doing uh, in the nation and in the nations. And uh, my heart especially uh, goes out to Pastor Shola um, and Pastor Grace, uh, especially Pastor Shola, because of his connection with Russia and the and the Ukraine, um, it must be a personal pain to him um, as to what's happening there. May the Lord hear our prayers for peace in that region. May God use the wicked plans of men to work out his own plans and purposes. Uh, may this be a trigger for a revival in that area in a way that you and I could never have imagined. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise God. Um, Shalom, I'm going to hand over to you. Thank you for having me. God bless you. Um, our love to Grace and the entire family. God bless you. Hallelujah. Wow. I'm laughing. I'm excited. I mean, the Holy Ghost, I'm bubbling. Wow. What an overflow. This is God. That's vintage PAI. My God, on another level. Is somebody blessed tonight? I'm ah, mega blessed. Would you go ahead and appreciate God? Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much. My God. My God. Stream of favor. My God. Wow. 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 Stay persistent. Stay insistent. Keep the fire burning. Delay is not denial. It's actually not God. It's, that's not a godly statement. It simply means the timing hasn't come. God is working it out. Wow. For he makes all things beautiful in his time. Will somebody join me and say, thank you, pastor. Thank you, PAI. Thank you, pastor. Come on. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Thank you for not preaching 35 minutes message to us. No, no. That, somebody said, let's continue all night. Wow. Wow. Rest. I know we are talking to somebody in that place. You need to rest. It's you we are talking to. My God, it's me, it's me, it's me. Wow, wow. Get up and eat. Get up and eat. My God, the fire must not go out. Glory to God. It mustn't go out. It mustn't go out. Thank you, Pastor. May God strengthen and uphold you in Jesus' name. 
May the Lord uphold you in righteousness. May his hand remain mighty upon you, upon Pastor Shola and every one of your family in the name of Jesus. What to stand for, what you have been doing in the past, the most I will yet take you to another level. Even in this new scene in Jesus' name. Thank you, sir. Thank you again and again. What an exposition. What a revelation. Wow. What a grace. Thank you, sir. Thank you and thank you. Are you excited now? There is no high priest on earth. Wow. Wow. Thank you, Reverend Yemi, for being on the altar. There is no high priest. There is only Jesus Christ, the mediator between man and God, who has two ministries now. Wow. Representations and intercession. What a word. Will somebody say a prayer for prayer tonight? Let's just say a word of prayer for him. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for your servant. Thank you for your son, Lord. Strengthen him, uphold him in righteousness. Take him further and further in Jesus' name. Also keep his prayers answered in the name of Jesus. And let him also keep the fire burning. Keep his family, O oh God. Protect them always. Surround them with your love and your presence. In Jesus' name we are prayed. Amen. Wow. Let me sing a song the way I'm feeling. I have decided to keep the fire. I have decided, forget my voice, to keep the fire. I have decided the fire will be burning. No turning back, no turning back. I have decided there will be some rest also. I have decided to sleep sometimes. I have decided to take you with me. No turning back. No turning back. Come on. I appreciate you. I God bless you, sir. In Jesus' name. Wow. Thank you for that powerful word. In the name of Jesus. We have come to that time right now. In Jesus' name. We're going to be out taking our communion together. Wow. And then we'll bring our offering to the Lord. Wow. The Bible says in Psalm 105, verse 37. Psalm 105, verse 37. He brought them forth also with silver and gold. And there was not one feeble person among their tribes. Among their tribes. I'm praying for us in the course of this year. There shall be no feeble person amongst our tribes in Jesus' name. We have no one to do to now look after the temple, protect the temple, walk it out so we don't go to heaven sooner than we are expected, so that we can fulfill the purpose of God for our lives. The purpose of God was that children of Israel, we go serve God in the wilderness. And the Lord made a provision for them. Glory to God. And what did he say to them? Bible says, the psalmist said, he brought them forth also. Somebody shout, I'm coming out of ignorance. I'm coming out of difficulty. I'm coming out of sicknesses. I'm coming out of, of bondages. I'm coming out. I'm coming out. He brought them forth also with silver and gold. When God brings you out, he does not make you less than you are. He makes you better than you started. That is our God. He takes you farther and farther. That is our God. And there was not one feeble person among their tribes, which means when God brings you out, health is part of the package. Healing is part of the package. Glory is part of the package. Thank you, Jesus. It's part of the package. It's part of the package. It's part of the package. You are coming out tonight of every sickness, every ignorance, every bondage, every assault of the enemy. We are not giving up. We are not stopping. We are going to keep the fire burning. You are coming out in the name of Jesus Christ. You're coming out. And you're not coming out poor. You're coming out better. You're going to come out better than you started. That's the mind of God. Now, the question, though, is this. What brought them out? How did they come out? It was a revelation of the Passover meal, which is a representative, a, for, a foreigner, a forsake, a, a view, view of the communion that brought that came on the scene. And Pharaoh said, I got to let you go. I can't keep you anymore. So tonight, by the spirit of the living God, as you partake of the communion, brother and sister, upon the word of God, you have been taking communion before. Tonight you are taking with a new understanding, a new revelation that the adversary does not have the final say over your life. Pharaoh had to let them go. Glory to Jesus. When the blood 
and the breath came on the scene. Pharaoh said, let them go. Let them go. Let them go. Somebody shout, I am coming out in the name of Jesus Christ. Tonight, listen to me, you can put an end, terminate sicknesses permanently, bondages permanently, is by faith to modulate that God is. And he said, the word of them, do diligently seek him. Beloved brother and sister, would you get your communal elements at this time? Get your communal elements. You're coming out better in Jesus' name. Let me speak American. You're coming out better in the name of Jesus. Come on out. You're coming out in the name of the Lord. Get your communal elements right now. The Bible says he took them, take the bread, the unleavened bread, and put the blood on your lintel. When the angel of death comes through, it will pass over you. Oh, I decree and I declare, every calamity of this year will pass over you in Jesus' name. Get your communal elements right now in the name of Jesus. And be ready to declare, as I partake of the bread, his body was broken, that mine may not be broken. Therefore, in the name of Jesus, as I partake of this bread, I receive allness in my body. I receive healing in my body. In the name of Jesus, I receive the strength of God. Elijah had to eat the meal so that he could Go in that strength for 40 days. Come on. You are receiving strength. Now, supernaturally, weaknesses are becoming a thing of the past. In the name of Jesus. The Bible said the same night in which he died, he took the bread. He broke it. And said, this is my body, which is broken for you. This eat in remembrance of me. Would you partake of the bread right now? Let's get the wine in Jesus' name. Remember, he brought them forth also with silver and gold. And there was not one feeble person among their tribes. In the house of God, on every, upon, out of everyone on this altar, no one here shall be feeble in Jesus' name. Not this year anymore. We curse sickness. We curse it to his root in the name of Jesus. Every cell of sickness, every cancerous cell, every cell that is contrary to the will of God, we curse it now in Jesus' name. As to partake of the blood, the blood we go fish them out, flush them out in the name of Jesus Christ. Glory to God. The enemy has no answer to the blood of Jesus. It is strongest voice in the universe. And the blood is going to speak for you now in Jesus' name. Bible says, same night in which he died, he took the cup and blessed it and sobbed and said, This is my blood which is shed for you, for the remission of your sins and for the New Testament. He says, Drink this, all of it, in remembrance of me. We remember that Jesus came to the world to deliver man from sin and from the devil and from the adversary. And tonight, as we partake of the blood, let the blood go into every aspect of our body, strengthening us, flushing out poisons and sicknesses. Everything that is contrary to the will of God in your body and my body is gone tonight in Jesus' name. And after you are partaking of this, don't leave the altar. You will pray for yourself for about two or three minutes before I stop you. Shall we partake in the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit? Shall we partake right now? Thank you, Jesus. Can you pray in the spirit if you can for a few moments? Mezo kete bragado shta hande. Maria gada bagado soto lo brege di mandash. Jenge de prekete mare keto ke pekete li bragadista. Jangada bragado soto rianda la bragado yandash. Me kote bari tatu tata la bragadoste. Menge de brege do santo rianda la bragadia. No more delay. There's no delay. There is only God's timing. Come on. God is. is a rewarder of them who take communion. A rewarder of them who diligently seek him. Come on. Me zagada bragadushta. Mandolo bregedishta. Ikali bayagadu zagada bragadia. Lay your hands on your head. 
and declare from the crown of my head to the tips of my toe, allness is my portion, healing is my lot, in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. In the name of the Lord, thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. We declare your oldness tonight in the name of Jesus. He brought them forth out also with silver and gold, and there was not one feeble person among their tribes. Contrary to every fact, the truth has been spoken tonight. You are healed, you are delivered, you are set free. Jesus is alive in the name of Jesus Christ. Every trait of weakness is over in your life in the name of Jesus. Thank you, our Redeemer. In Jesus' name we pray. Right now, we're going to bring our offerings to the Lord and just bless the name of the Lord. After that, I'll come and do the closing prayer and we shall be out. Let's bring our tithes and offerings to the Lord. Remember, he brought them out. Fought also with silver and gold. Remain persistent in your giving and your answer will come. Pastor told us there's a stream of favor in the body of Christ right now. There's a stream of favor. It's time to lock on to it as we honor God with our tithes and offering. God bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Wherever you are this evening, I'd like us to just lift our voice and just give God some praise. Are you ready? Come on! Jesus of honor. I have come to give back to you I have come to say thank you Lord I have come to give back to you hey! I have come to say thank you Lord Say take all the praise take all
Hallelujah. Praise be the Lord. Somebody wave your hands to Jesus. Hallelujah. Wave, 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 wave. wave your hands to the Almighty God. Hallelujah. Glory. Glory to Jesus. Amen and amen. Oh, hallelujah. God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Let's appreciate God. Come on. He has been good to us. He has been wonderful. He has been mighty. He has... Would you go ahead and praise him? Let's love him. Let's love him. Blessed Holy Spirit, we say thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, please note, uh, our announcement is on Sunday. By the grace of God, it's going to be our prophetic praise Sunday. And we are supposed to be attired in jeans. Attired in jeans. Now, hear this. Royal Men Fellowship invites all men to a special breakfast meeting. And the theme is men. Can we talk? The date is 19th of March, 2022. Venue is Throck Hotel, Ship Lane, Throck Excess, RM 191YN. The time is 9 a.m. in the morning. Please do call Obina Aaron to register or just simply call that number. The cost is 20 pounds per person. And please, you can deal with that on Sunday. God bless you, even before that, in Jesus' name. The fast continues the 2nd of March, coming to an end very soon. Amen. Thanksgiving Sunday, 6th of March, to book your virtue, Thanksgiving or testimony, please email your request with your photograph to info at realconnections.talk.uk. Up is here. It's, wow, a prophetic day on the 1st of March at 6 a.m. And the theme is Jesus is Alive. It's going to be on the YouTube channel and Instagram and all of the accesses. God bless you in Jesus' name. Prophetic Praise Sunday, 27th of February. That's in two days' time. It's a jeans Sunday. Come dressed in your jeans. Amen. And your trainers and just get ready, get sharp to stomp on the enemy and to have some fun in church. Amen. I'm looking forward to it in Jesus' name. Glory be to the Almighty God. Amen and amen. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, thank you for such a wonderful night and a great time. Thank you for the revelation of your word. We are so grateful for divine visitation. Accept our thanks in Jesus' name. Thank you for replenishing your son, strengthening and upholding his family in Jesus' name. Lord, we now pray every word declared over us shall become performed a reality in the name of Jesus. We are not giving in. We are not giving up. We are not stopping. We are pressing forward in Jesus' name. And there shall be unusual results in the name of of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Heavenly Father. We bless your holy name, O oh God. In Jesus' name we pray. Now listen. Remember what we said to bring on Sunday. Alright? For the birthday. Remember the birthday. Okay? To bring. So everybody please bring yours on Sunday. We'll be collecting them on Sunday. God bless you for the birthday. Remember. Okay? For that in Geo, we'll be collecting it on Sunday. God bless you mightily in the name of Jesus. Amen. Shall we take our confession together? Let's go. 2022 is a year of God and God alone. God is the center of my life, body, soul, and spirit. I trust in Him, hope in Him, live to please Him. God is blessing me, you, and we are connections. Together we are living witnesses for Christ. Jesus is Lord. Amen. Have a good night. God bless you. Keep the fire burning in Jesus' name. Amen.